welcome to Silax, the podcast where we talk about scientific developments and technological changes in Luxembourg. As usual, proudly powered by Research Luxembourg. And today, for the first time, we're talking about technology more than science. And I'm very, very excited to have my guest today here with me. And it's Angelika Bocian Javorska, who is the founder of Erdlab, which 3D prints organic materials. Angelika is an architect by education interested in sustainable constructions. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, thank you for having me. Okay, so as I said, sustainable constructions and 3D printing. And I want to start actually with 3D printing because I have to say that we haven't visited your labs yet. I hope to see that later. And I've never really seen a 3D printer. So I'm a brilliant oh, okay. target to explain it to me in good words so I understand what is actually a 3D printer and how does it work. So I would maybe start with what's 3D printing. So additive manufacturing which means that the machine is manufacturing your object layer by layer, and then it goes to the, to the top. So basically what you need to 3D print the object you want is, of course, 3D printer, so the machine which can make it happen. Slicing software, your modeling software, and of course my material. And the material defines the result of your printing, and there are different 3D printers dedicated for different materials. So probably the most popular 3D printers are the ones which are working with plastic. So as you probably saw, this, this kind of thin lines, this is filament. So mostly this is plastic or recycled plastic. And these machines are now, I think, available in every school, every university for sure. But I'm focusing, as you mentioned, on organic materials, sustainable materials. So my 3D printers work only with clay. And these have to be specialized 3D printers. Um, yes, because, as I said, material defines the printer. So, for example, printers for plastic, they they melt the material. Also, the bed is heated so the, the print can stick to it. In case of clay, the material is exactly the same as I prepare it and I put it to the tank. So it's not heated, it's not melted. It's exactly the same softness I prepared it. So the machine is a bit different. Of course, I also need a screw that is uh, pushing the material. I need an air compressor. So the air is pushing the material down. So it's a bit different. Yes, always the, the material defines which printer you need to use. The same for resin or right now you can even 3D print wood and you can as well 3D print metal, for example, and that's also a completely different machine. Okay, so that's a lot of materials I had no clue about. But wait, do you know how the wood process goes? I, I'm asking you for a non-specialized non thing because we're talking clay. But what type of wood do you need to give it to? Because I guess it's also a question of pre-processing the material in this yes, case. Yes, definitely. It's actually connected to what I'm doing because I'm really fascinated right now by 3D printing wood and actually merging 3D printing wood with 3D printing clay. That's quite challenging, but that's my plan for the next year. So 3D printing wood can be different. So you can get actually the filament, so these thin lines, but this is mostly like some wood fibers mixed with plastic. So it's not really sustainable. But the 3D printing wood I'm thinking of is a, is a granulate. So like these little bowls made with wood waste that are actually melted to be 3D printed. And what is really fascinating for me is mixing together 3D printing clay and at the same time melting wood. So you get one paste, one mixed material, and you can extrude this kind of mixture. Really looking forward because that's something I'm dreaming of. And it's, it's basically defined not by my dreams. I came to this idea when I saw the uh, wooden 3D prints because they are very light, but they have very good compressive strength. And that's what I'm always looking for in, in my 3D printing clay process for these bigger projects, for the research projects. But let's still focus on the material side. So what I understand is that for clay, you need to source the clay from somewhere. So where do you get it? For the small prints like ceramics, is the same clay you use for handmade ceramics. You can get it in every shop. You just have to, to use the clay which is smooth without sand inside. So that's quite easy. For the research project I have right now, so furniture and bricks, this is more complicated. 
Of course, my goal was always to use with the local materials, so the materials from Luxembourg. And I already had some experience for the exhibition in the last Luxembourg Pavilion in Expo in Dubai to use locally sourced clay from Nospelt, which is very well known in Luxembourg, to make these little birds for Easter. And that was quite smooth material, so it worked well for, for small prints. Right now, I, as I said, I'm working with the scale of furniture and bricks and I'm getting my material here also locally sourced, which is sometimes the, the clay waste from construction or sometimes it's just excavated here in, in the region, in Luxembourg or in the Grand Region. So I'm working with the local materials. We have very good clay in Luxembourg. So I'm, I'm very happy <laughs> that I can actually use this, we say, zero kilometer material, which means is sourced locally. I'm just already imagining the, you know, the transportation part. So, okay, you want clay from Luxembourg. What happens then? You just have to probably get in touch with the people who get the clay out and then you just get a truck here with the clay or like, how does it work? I'm working in collaboration with some, not construction, but the, the companies that are providing aggregates and um, sand and different types of clay for construction purpose. So at the beginning, I discuss with them what would be the, the best clay for me. The main factor I'm looking at is uh, how much sand is inside how sticky it is when it gets wet. But I would say the main pro property I'm checking is the little stones inside. Because as you can imagine, my printer is not that big. The screw inside is not huge. So I have to always find a material which can easily be extruded. Otherwise, the machine gets stuck and it gets broken and I have many problems. So yeah, sourcing the material is always the, the key for the final success or failure in your printing process. You keep mentioning how much sand there is. So I was just thinking that probably this is the right moment for you to ask the pub quiz question you prepared. The pub quiz question is actually related to another thing you're hoping to go into very soon. So architecture, right? And 3D printed buildings. But we'll discuss it for sure. But let's first ask the question. And listeners, please remember the answer only at the end. So listen carefully. So I have a question about climate changes and crisis we are facing right now. As probably everyone knows about CO2 emissions and how big problem it is right now, but maybe not everyone is aware that we are also facing a shortage of materials we are using for construction, like for example, sand, which is necessary for concrete production. And my question is, do you know where United Arab Emirates source their sand for construction. Okay, great. Fascinating question. And of course, the answer only at the end. So I just kind of drifted away a bit from the sand, but coming back to Luxembourgish clay, not United yes. Arab Emirates. So basically you get the clay and you are sure, okay, no small stones, it's perfect. And then what happens? Then I have to define my material mix because... Clay, that's the, my main builder for, for my piece. But of course, it's not enough, as you can imagine, to just print the, the or even make the clay object and to use it to sit on it or to, to make a, a wall out of this. Because as you can imagine, clay for ceramic purpose has to be fired. My research projects are defined by CO2 emissions. So like we are planning to have zero carbon impact on these products, which means that they will not be fired. So I have to find some magic powders that can bind them all together. So the piece is printable, so the material is printable, but after that it can dry with the air like concrete, but without cement. So I have to search for some green replacements for cement and something that it can bind them all together and um, the other ingredients that helps avoid shrinking and cracking of the piece and especially in case of outdoor furniture help the, the furniture to be waterproof but still recyclable so these are the main ingredients i have to search for in my research process okay very challenging i'm <laughs> yes. trying not to laugh but this is really like the equation is is crazy right because yeah. for of course if you gain on the on one side it actually makes you lose on the other side yes, right yes. Okay, so how do you search for that? I, I don't assume you just go out and start digging and looking for materials. No, no, it, uh, that would be 
quite challenging. So I rely on my knowledge gained at the university in the institute where I did my postgraduate studies about 3D printing clay architecture, so quite specific. But that so there, was, wait, 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 wait. There are studies like that? Yes, already? postgraduate studies. Okay. Uh, but that was in Barcelona. So we used local materials. As you can imagine, the clay was different. We also used dry palm leaves. We don't have palms, unfortunately, no. in Luxembourg. So I cannot <laughs> do, do this here. My knowledge is based on what I learned in the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. But at the same time, I'm based here in the IFSB and NeoBuild, and NeoBuild Innovation Center. So I work in the collaboration with the experts from construction sector. And this is extremely helpful to, to have the, their support and their knowledge of how to make my own recipe that can work, how to use the, the elements from current construction sector that work well, how to replace the materials which are not sustainable. And this is how this process is slowly moving forward. You're a very special type of an architect, I would say, because as far as I know, not all the architects actually talk so much to the construction specialists. The, the link here is very, very crucial, isn't it? True, you're right. It's because I'm the architect who doesn't believe in architecture right now in the form that, that it exists right now. I think we are still based on modernism. That was, you know, started after Second World War. So you can imagine that it was a long time ago, sometimes even before that. And apparently it's very form centric. So everything is about form. And this is how the generation of architects are educated. And unfortunately, even my generation of architects is educated this way. And this is what the last Biennale, Architecture Biennale in Venice showed, is that architects love to debate about the crisis. And it's very important, of course, but it's not enough, in my opinion. Everyone has a manifesto about how bad it is, but I couldn't really see the solutions in the last Biennale. Not only Luxembourg, I mean, the, the pavilion was amazing, but it was focused on something else. But other exhibitions, which were really focusing on the architecture in each country, they, they didn't propose anything new. And as we are facing, and maybe not even facing, but we are really in, in the middle of the crisis, of like sustainable climate crisis, housing crisis, we have to find a solution as fast as possible. And it has to be a solution that can be affordable and can be scaled very fast. And that I think the crucial factor is working very close to the industry. So that's what my mission was, Airlab mission, is to, um, to research for products, for solutions that at the same time can be developed with the industry. So they can be certified and can be in a few years massively manufactured and used in Luxembourg, in the European Union, and then maybe even outside Europe. So I think that's, that's crucial. Without this, we cannot move forward because architecture cannot be form-centric anymore. It has to be materials-focused. That's why I'm here in the Luxembourg Construction Training and Certification Center in the heart of all this institution. Yeah, I'm, I think that's the, the best place to be. And it's interesting what you said about the certification as well, because of course, you know, you can innovate, you can make amazing materials, you can make amazing cups that we're drinking from, but when we're talking housing... You can't just, you know, 3D print clay and then say, okay, people live there. It, it's just a very rigorous process, isn't it? True. Especially as you can imagine, construction sector is very traditional, is very conservative. Every innovation, first of all, costs money and certification as well takes a lot of time. So it's not very welcome, I would say. <laughs> even though everyone talks about we need to change it, uh, CO2 emissions, even like European Union right now, created this European emission trading scheme. So in Luxembourg, in 12 years, concrete and cement companies, they have to reduce their CO2 emissions by 64%, which is huge. At the same time, no one really is seeking for innovation, I would say. So certification is the main challenge for any innovation in construction industry. And that's the main problem for all the startups in this ecosystem, because you can make beautiful product, sometimes very nice material, very nice performance, and you cannot certify this product, which means it will never be used. So that's why I'm working with the industry very close, as close as, as I can, to create the products like 3D printed self-drying clay bricks that can be at the same time 
adjusted to the needs of the industry and that can be certified. So I'm collecting as many opinions of experts from this industry in Luxembourg, um, not only in Luxembourg, to to know how I can do it as fast as possible, but still as good as possible to avoid the situation that okay, I, I made these amazing bricks. They are not only blocks, they are made with locally sourced materials, but then at the end, nobody wants to use them. And then also there is the challenge you mentioned, the fact that, you know, with 3D printing, you're actually printing layer by layer, right? So this is also, from my lay perspective, a challenge for the certification itself and the fact that it has to be robust and strong enough for construction, right? Because yes. it's a layered thing yes. or not. That's why I'm working with clay. I fell in love with this material because clay has very good properties, very good compressive strength, which means that it works very good with compression. So you can sit on it. You know, we can imagine that it can transport loads from the top to the bottom. However, you cannot make horizontal elements with clay. Concrete is different. Concrete is quite universal. Clay is not. So it's very good for, for bricks, for making walls. Things like this. Because when you're printing, 3D printing, it's it's a question of, of putting one layer after the other. Yes. So my assumption is that it's not going to be as good as, as concrete, right, in this case. Depends. Also depends on the binding in between. It can be. But why, I, why I'm working with clay mostly is that the clay has other properties that concrete does not have. For example, it can absorb heat during the sunny day, you can imagine, which then can be transported inside your house at night which means that you don't need to heat up your house that much. At the same time, it's it's a material that is self-humidating, which means in a sunny, hot day, you don't need to use air condition inside because it's self-regulating. At the same time, you can play a bit with the design because when I mention brick, it can be size of the brick, but can be also size of the prefabricated wall element. And you can, you can design it in the way that you you gain some heat, you can absorb some uh, sun radiation from one side, for example, from the south facade, but on the other side, when you need more ventilation, you can still design it, this part of wall differently, and you hide all the insulation, all the installations inside. It's not like the, the walls we are used to, so you have the, the bricks or you have the concrete, and then you put insulation outside, and then you put the facade. No, I'm talking about like completely holistic approach that you see your natural material from inside and outside of the house and all the technical installations and insulation is hidden inside because of the cavities. So you can imagine that these bricks don't have shape of a classic brick, just block, but they have some organic shape that when you assemble them together, create this kind of biomorphic design. I think this change of typology of architecture, that's something that has to happen because we cannot build cubes anymore. And I'm very happy that if we make this shift in, in materials and in the manufacturing process, like 3D printing, you cannot really have these right angles. And I think right angles are not perfect for, for people. You know, they are not inspired by nature. And we are as humans, we feel the best in the rooms, in spaces that actually are nature inspired. So they are this biomorphic design. I'm fascinated by this. Yeah, I can see the passion just <laughs> speaking through what you're saying. But also, you know, it means basically going back a little bit to the roots, right? Because, well, we yeah. didn't say it, but we used to live in clay houses before. Yeah. That's the oldest construction material that ever has been used. And that's the, that's the material that the very first human habitats were built with. I don't think that this can be a problem for humans to get back to, to clay. However, I'm working with 3D printing, as you said, because I think we, we should source the knowledge we have from centuries. Uh, but at the same time, we should use the technology that is given to us that was created of course, 3D printing is not a brand new technology, but it's still very useful. And merging these two, so new technology of traditional material, that's something which can help us to solve, I think, both climate crisis and housing crisis, because you can print very fast thanks to algorithmic design. The design process doesn't take that long as it happens now. And you can create houses that are adjusted to the needs of each family very fast and cheap. That's my dream. And um, I think it can happen. 
it reminds me, you know, in, in medicine, we talk about precision medicine. So here we could have precision architecture, like, yeah. you know, adjusted really to the needs of the people, right? So which, which sounds really cool. I wouldn't mind that for sure. But, you know, it also takes a bit of courage to, to start doing it. So fingers crossed for that. But we already see that this year has been an amazing year for you. Because to be honest, I've been... Uh, you know, looking into what you're doing for quite some time now. And I just, nowadays, I keep getting bombarded this program, that challenge, and really a lot of prizes. So congratulations for that. And the first one I wanted to mention was the Circular by Design Challenge. So what was it about? And what was the final result of it? Uh, so Circular by Design Challenge, that's one of the programs, competition actually, organized by Lux Innovation, together with Creative Cluster. And they announced it every year. This year it was launched with four different categories and one of the categories that, that was my category was multifunctional urban furniture. So as you can imagine, I propose 3D printed clay furniture made with uh, locally sourced soil and with actual powder as a green replacement for cement. And uh, yeah, I won the, the competition, this category. There was some fin financial award, which was basically I spent on the bigger machine but another award was the possibility to discuss this furniture uh, with the um, Expo Osaka Pavilion Committee, so the Ministry of Economy, and LUGA, so the Urban Garden event show, which will take place in Luxembourg in 2025. For the competition, I showed the, the prototype of the furniture. Right now, I showed to, to both of the institutions first working prototype so one-to-one -one scale and right now i'm testing water resistance and different still different recipes so that the furniture can be ready uh, next year and can be used in the pavilion luxembourg pavilion in osaka and in luga that would be great and then when it comes back to luxembourg it can be also used in some public spaces in luxembourg and when it's not needed anymore it can be fully recycled that's the idea. And the recipe is still not as good as I want it to be, but slowly we are getting there. The next year I will get the help of employee. So I'm, I'm looking forward. I'm quite optimistic of the, about this. And I think it would be great to show this kind of furniture in both these events because there's something that I guess none of the countries can show. So that's something which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. What kind of furniture is it? So I started with stools and tables, but we are now trying to also have some higher desks so the speakers can, can use it at the opening ceremony and events like that. Trash bins, plant pots, so this kind of furniture. Sounds amazing. I will be definitely looking forward to it. I'm not sure whether I'll manage to go to Osaka, but at least the urban gardens later on, hopefully we'll see. And I'm sure it's going to be other places as well once it's done and tested. But you mentioned testing. So I was just thinking, okay, so we discussed the material. You put it in, you print it. I get slicing, layering, you get the thing. You're not drying it with uh, any kind of uh, furnace. It actually dries air dried. Okay, but then you have to test it, as you said. So you have some probably stress testing, whatever. Do you do Compress it? Testing. Do you do it yourself as well? No, no. I have a facility here uh, that uh, and some experts that can check that. So make uh, independent tests and give me the results and help me to improve my material samples. So no worries. I have somebody who, who has experience to do this. And we are testing many samples and we see the results. Okay, there's this new ingredient. Sometimes we get, because of some European projects that are being developed here, I get some samples for testing and I'm checking, does it help? Does it improve the performance? If not, I'm giving up this one and I'm checking something else. So I have a big help here at, uh, at SEDEC and uh, IFSB. Because I was wondering, you know, you're an architect, but you seem to be doing really A to Z. So that's why you have become an expert in so many different fields. It sounds more like material engineering than architecture, I think. I have to be kind of, but uh, of course, m my background is architecture, as you said. So I don't know everything. And it's it's very useful to to talk to some like, proper engineers, material engineers, construction engineers, static engineers to, to know what's the, the best solution for my product. Because sometimes you are so fixed on, on one problem that you don't see another one, or sometimes you don't even see the solution, which is very close to you. 
So that's why I'm not doing it completely on my own. That would be too too risky and too difficult. Of course. You mentioned that for the houses, you're printing something that you call the bricks that are not exactly the way we think about it. But for the furniture, do you print just one piece altogether or is it also different pieces? No, for the furniture, it will be each piece will be printed separately, but as a one piece. So then you need a huge printer, I assume. Yes, I have quite a big printer, but I'm getting the even bigger one next year. I'm very happy because uh, every printer you get becomes too small after a few months. So not even in in, in the height, but in the um, in the printing bed, let's say size. So forty centimeters diameter right now is not enough, as you can imagine. It's it's enough for the stool, but if you want to have a bigger table, it's quite small. So you're seriously growing. You know, when you check your website, I love the fact that when you look at the team, it's you and then the printers, right? And for each printer, you actually chose a name, right? So we have Johnny, we have Baby, and Romeo. Yeah. What's the story behind the names? A baby, I understand probably because of the size, right? Or no, not? Johnny and Baby, that's from one movie that ah. you probably will guess quite easily. Yes. Then was Romeo and now Juliet is also here. So ah. Juliet is a pump that will help uh, Romeo to have <laughs> continuous feeding. So I don't need to change the clay all the time when it's finished, So which is very helpful because most of the time I spend on preparing clay and that's quite time consuming tiring and then you you can imagine when your clay is finished in the tongue your print is basically finished as well so continuous feeding system helps printing to the infinity so i'm very very happy so romeo juliet you can also guess the movie or the book so that was they always work in pairs let's say yes that was the um, and the newest i still don't have a name maybe i'll make a competition you should i'm sure that loads of people will be motivated if you share like a small cup or mug for Probably, choosing yeah. names uh, i'm 100 percent sure if you do decide let me know i will promote the okay. competition as Thank well you. so the listeners can participate too but obviously the dream team member apart from the human that will join us next year it's a robotic arm because then uh, you are quite flexible with with the size, um, with the performance. So I'm, I'm looking forward, but at this moment, it's still easier with the 3D printers they have now, but the future is robotic arms, definitely. So hopefully uh, once you're done with the Fit for Start program, you get a robotic arm. Maybe, yes, I hope. If there is a right moment, definitely, yes, because every machine needs <laughs> special treatment as well. So obviously, yeah. Small robotic arm can be fixed to a table, but a big one has to be fixed properly to the floor. So there are all some conditions you have to go through to to have your robotic arm, but that's definitely the future. Yes, definitely. I just mentioned Fit for Start just in order to have also another important program that you participated in and you are one of the startups, right? Yes, I got selected to the final. So we start the coaching acceleration program in January. So this is also very important for me, for my company, because it's not only the grant, non-dilutive grant, but it's also proper coaching and as I know from the from Circular by Design Challenge, these programs organized by Lux Innovation, they're really well prepared. And so I'm looking forward. They will be even more intensive than, than the previous competition. So it, it's not a competition anymore. It's more like you have to focus on your business and business model and your market validation and so on. So really like pure business. That's very important for me because... Again, as I mentioned, my background is architecture. I have no business background to, no preparation to have this company. So I have to be right now everyone in my company. So that's, that's very important for Edlab to, to be ready to be on the market. Of course, definitely. But it's not only this, because there is also another material that you're looking at. So we said about the wood and the excitement of wood and clay, right? We talked wood, but there is also actual powder. What's going on with that? Yeah, so the actual powder, I, first time I actually used it in the furniture for Circular by Design Challenge. I, I think it's, it's a funny story because I'm fascinated by the stories that you can actually use waste to make something to not even to recycle it, but to upcycle it, to give it more value than before. So I found the news that 
Luxembourg is in the third place in Europe in egg consumption. Basically, it's more or less one egg per person per day in Luxembourg. That's not even healthy as far as I know, right? That's <laughs> another topic. But um, <laughs> then imagine like how much egg waste we produce. So the actuals, they are, in most cases, they are just trash. And when I make a research about actual and actual powders, so basically the powder you make out of actuals, it's very interesting because in 98% is built with calcium. So, okay, calcium, we already know, like bones, something strong, then something rigid. And I'm, I was thinking, like, why not merging these two options? And then I even found news that there is some research on like how to use actual powder for for concrete to reduce cement consumption. So then I thought, okay, that can be as well something interesting to test with clay. And uh, it's true that it improves the performance of clay. There is compressive strength for small prototypes. It's enough. Unfortunately, it's not enough for for stools that people can sit on, but it already gave a lot of value. So I'm for the furniture, I'm still using um, actual powder because, as I mentioned, the furniture has to be recycled when it's not needed anymore. And the, the good, good news is that actual powder can actually improve the properties of the soil locally. So imagine that you can even do it at home in your garden. You use the actuals, you put them to the soil, uh, you get uh, better plants uh, growing and uh, faster growing on uh, in this uh, area. So when we don't need my furniture, we can destroy it, put it to small pieces and... And you cry when it's destroyed. <laughs> yes, but that's the, the life cycle. And then you put it to the back to the ground and you can still have your garden even benefits for this. I think that's amazing. That's the whole story, how we should design products, you know? It's just completely opposite, all this IKEA scheme of life. When you're a student, you get very really cheap furniture and then you just don't you don't care what's happening to this furniture. And then what happens is in the US, 90% of furniture ends up in a landfill. It's crazy. And I feel like as okay, as I'm an architect, I'm a designer, I should think like the, the whole life cycle of my product because I don't want to end up in the situation that I produced so much of even bricks or of my furniture and then one day I just see that it's just basically somewhere in the landfill. Nobody can use it. Nobody wants to use it. I don't want that. I want my products to be helpful and to, to, be, to have value from the very beginning to the very end. Sounds great. And I think this is the right moment to go back to one of the problems we discussed in the beginning in the pub quiz question, right? Because that's also something that we're getting wrong. Most probably I have to already hint at yeah. the answer. My question is, do you know where United Arab Emirates source their sand for construction? Why we are talking about this? Why do we need to avoid concrete? That's the main question many people ask themselves because we are so used to concrete. Concrete is fine for many people. The answer is not only CO2 emissions. No, it's not concrete that produces CO2. It's cement that is uh, one of the most important and the main ingredients of concrete. But concrete needs as well a lot of sand for production. We are facing not only a problem with CO2 emissions, but with shortage of resources like sand. And what happens is that even countries like United Arab Emirates, they have to import sand for their local concrete production. And you might ask why they cannot just use their sand, which is there. Uh, the answer is this sand is too smooth for construction purpose. Ah. So actually we cannot use this sand for, for construction. And what happens is that even countries like UAE, they have to import sand and excavate it from the seabeds and bottom of the oceans in the area um, around Australia. So if we are focusing on even CO2 emissions and then we still need to transport thousands of kilometers uh, the sand from the bottom of the ocean and we destroy this ecosystem there... I think that's the moment when we have to say it loud, we cannot continue like this. 
So that's why I feel, at least in the places like Luxembourg, when you can use these zero kilometer materials, locally sourced materials, which are basically waste in many cases, they are the, the, the material that is waste from construction. I think that's the, the approach we should have. That I have a field plot somewhere, or you have, and you want to have your house built with the material you have there, so you don't need to pay more for the materials. We don't need to transport your sand, your cement, and so on. We just use the material which is there. We print your house. After 50 years, you don't want this house anymore. We can still destroy it, put it back to soil. It will not change the pH of the soil locally. I think that's the approach we should have. And then automatically, the, the cost of your house will decrease because right now, half of the cost of construction is the labor. And there is this still the argument said many times that people will lose jobs. But actually in the construction sector, there is huge labor shortage right now because people don't want to work in the construction sector, which is kind of understandable because it's very dangerous and it's very hard f physical work. So I think technology like 3D printing, even right now, prefabrication, but maybe in 10 years, 20 years, 3D printing on site can be a solution because you don't need that many people. It's safer than construction right now and you don't need to pay that many employees on your site and you don't need to pay for the materials because material can be yours, right? From your plot. Sounds great. Best way to finish our discussion. Thank you so much, Angelica, for coming today and telling us all about 3D printing, clay and sustainability. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed and let's make earth better place together only together because just one person cannot change anything but the ecosystem can change the world of course and we will share all the important links in the show notes as usual you can go check out what you can right now already buy that is 3d printed in Luxembourg we didn't mention that but there is a possibility to do that too maybe a Christmas gift who knows <laughs> Remember to listen to the other episodes. We are available on all the social media, all the podcasting platforms. Share your information, your opinion, your suggestions for guests, anything else. We're always open to your ideas. And this was Silax, and my name is Hanna Siemaszko.